Like well, you know, it, but... All right. Very good. Hello and welcome. I'm Karen Kinzel, the director of the Palo Alto Arts Center, and I'm delighted to see you all here on Zoom this evening for a very special conversation about environmental art with Fire Transforms guest curator Rena Filetti. Um, as most of you know, Fire Transforms is part of a series of exhibitions, Climate Connections at the Art Center this year. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to see Fire Transforms. Um, it's an amazing exhibition up through December 10th. Very excited that we were featured uh, this week in a, um, an online article uh, with Smithsonian Magazine about the exhibition. And Hyperallergic actually also did a feature. So lots of coverage for this exhibition um, because of its incredible quality and timeliness. And that's all thanks to Rena. Uh, before I introduce Rena, I want to thank you all for your support of the Art Center. Your membership and support helps to make exhibitions like Fire Transforms possible um, and uh, helps to support the numerous artists who are part of the exhibition. So thank you. And I'd now like to introduce Rena Filetti, who we have greatly enjoyed working with um, over the past few months. Art historian and curator Rena Filetti, PhD, organizes exhibitions and public programs about wildfire as a direct response to a need for community gathering, processing, and healing after catastrophic wildfire events. And she is the founding director of Art Response. Welcome, Rena. I'm going to turn my camera off so it's just you. Um, and then maybe uh, when you're done with a slide presentation, we can, um, uh, when people engage in conversation and ask questions, we can kind of put our video back on. Welcome, Great. Rena. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is that a yes? Okay, good. So I know there was an issue before. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here today with you. Um, since we have a small audience, I want to be able to make it interactive as possible. I will um, do a little bit of a slide lecture at the beginning, which um, is one of my favorite topics, the history of environmental art. And um, I'm going to do it um, in a way that I give you some images that show you know, where ideas that that we think of as environmental art today in 2022 came from going way back into the 20th, 20th century. <clears throat> and um, it's of endless interest. There's so many different things we could talk about, but I'm just giving you a few um, images so that you can sort of use those as kind of anchors for when you look at environmental art today, can, that what contemporary artists are doing it's always nice to know, well, gee, where did this come from? And as a historian, that's my favorite thing to talk about. So the artists who were invited to Fire Transforms um, all have a very, very serious, long and sophisticated practice embedded in ideas of environmental art. Even though some of them are not art historians, um, they do think about the history of the environment um, today, um, our key words, um, I'm going to go ahead there, our key terms for environmental art are words that you, that we hear of and speak of all the time now. Um, first of all, the main big ideas are how is the environment um, connected to power issues, to equity issues, and to agency issues. Um, I would also add access issues. Um, those are related today to politics to ideas of justice and of course, ideas of aesthetics. Art is um, part of an aesthetic practice, which is um, visual for some artists, performative for others, um, musical or has to do with sound for others, uh, manipulating clay or, or textiles or other materials for others and some working actually outside in, um, in the outside um, elements. Um, we've called environmental art through history several different names. Um, earliest on, we just called it landscape art, landscape painting, landscape photography. Um, later in the middle of the 20th century, going into the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and into the 80s, and now there's a resurgence, resurgence excuse me, of um, a type of built art outside usually quite large, called land art or earth art or earthworks. Um, once this political 
and justice and aesthetics power equity agency issues came in as a way of seeing the environment as tied to the ways that we think of social uh, justice, uh, uh, racial equity, um, gender equality, then we start to talk, it, talk to it more as eco art, um, ecological art, um, ideas of, of the ecology um, and artists expressing those things as a way to involve their art in a type of activism. Um, now, today we call this whole kind of um, idea environmental art, and it includes all of the above. Um, environmental art, just like many social movements now, um, especially in the last five to 10 years, we've had a real resurgence, just like what we might say back in the 60s, when um, what, what many people think of as the protest era, um, as being a, type, a time when we have um, gatherings, um, certainly protests, um, Occupy movements, et cetera, that are really focused on using art and images to be able to um, talk about political um, ideas with all these, um, these concepts that I've just um, mentioned. In environmental um, activism for artists, of course, what we talk about are the current terms, climate change and global warming, the big word Anthropocene, which if you know the word, it may be confusing. And if you don't know the word, it's confusing. It's a giant word that came from the academic world, but which you will see, which simply is considered, it's, it's naming the big era of when humans began to involve themselves and manipulate their environment. Um, we talk about differences and similarities between nature and culture. Um, we begin to talk about earth and environment as more than human and start to notice that we, when we act on the environment, then that changes us as well. So there needs to be an interaction between us, um, most environmental artists would say. And then the idea of nature as having agency just as much as humans have agency. When we talk about wildfire, the wildfire is doing its own action. And yes, we were connected with why that started, but nature also has agency. And I think in our period, we're starting to uh, respect that and respect all of these ideas consciously a little bit more. And most environmental artists are doing a very conscious practice about environmental art. And that would include all of the artists in our exhibition, um, Fire Transforms, are people who, who are up on this type of uh, thinking and um, are thinking about those things in their research and their creating. So the different kinds of um, currents in environmental art history are different things like, uh, we might call them genres, but they're just types of currents that go through environmental art history. Landscape painting and photography, I'll talk a little bit about that today because it touches on some of our artists. Documentary photography and film, um, found objects and multimedia sculpture that are related to the environment. Um, something called site-specific installations that came up through um, modern and postmodern art in the 20th century. And um, we have some installations in our exhibition also. And then a very interesting type of new art called data mapping visualization art. And we have two artists, uh, three really, who work in this type of work, which I'll show you. And then all artists are starting to think if they're environmental artists, most artists are starting to think about the use or creation of sustainable materials, um, those that don't harm the environment any more than they need to, and in some cases can help uh, sustain environment. So those are some of the terms. If anybody has any questions at any time, Karen, go ahead and let people raise their hands or unmute yourself or anything, because as I said, there's only eight folks in the, in the room, so to speak, today. And so if you have any questions, please stop and ask. I love our logo, Fire, Fire Transforms. Um, and uh, we'll move right in to the idea of landscape painting and photography, because this is really the key. Uh, going back in art history, it's landscape and conceptions of landscape that really are the, um, the ideas in art that start the um, through the centuries are thinking about what is our responsibility to the 
environment, to the land, to water, to trees, um, to the natural world, and how are we part of the natural world as well. Um, one thing that we weren't able to represent in this particular show just because of the way things worked out was indigenous or, or first peoples or native art. You know, we're going into an era where we're thinking of the of nature and humans as being interconnected. And we um, are hearing, especially in the wildfire world and the firefighting world, that going into the ideas that indigenous and um, first peoples and native peoples were using to be able to manage the landscape in a physical way so that they could both um, um, get what they needed from the landscape, that is shelter and food and their um, own lifestyle, but they also wildfire to be able to help with that and 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 revere nature as a being with agency that was part that they that we all were part of. And that's a type of a philosophy that we're going, you know, I don't want to say going back to because that's um, that's partly correct, but moving into as an entire global society um, to try to find a way to save ourselves, the planet, and our grandchildren's and great-grandchildren's planet. So the first artist I want to call your attention to, and then we'll talk about the history right after I show you the work, is Young Sue's landscapes that he took through smoke. So what you have to do with this is one person the other day when I gave a lecture said, oh, you put up a, a, a bad slide. You'll change that in a moment, right? No, this is a photograph. It's a photograph that Young took when he was um, get, getting permission to go into burn, uh, controlled burn areas. This is not a wildfire. It's a controlled managed burn. And so he was able to get quite close and take pictures through smoke. And I will show you in a moment what kinds of landscape history he was thinking of when he was making these. As your eyes adjust to this, you have to adjust to this photograph just like you have to adjust to looking through smoke or fog. Um, it's not clear immediately. But now that your eyes are adjusting and you look, look at this picture, you'll see even if you've got a reflection on your screen that there is a fire um, in the middle, lower part of the um of the picture if you look to the upper left you'll see that there's some foliage from trees hanging down over this scene if you look to the lower left in the lower left corner you'll see that there's a burned bush or some kind of organic material and then as your eyes ju adjust further if you look into the right corner you'll see that it looks like a rock or some kind of a burn material on the ground. So you can see now that this is a landscape, but it's a very, very difficult to see. And this was Young's entire idea. He also says, when you walk in to these pictures, so to speak, he wants you to evoke what it's actually like to walk into a smoky environment, a smoke-filled environment. We've all experienced that to one degree or another, living in um, our area because at any day or another, whichever way the wind is blowing, then you have that smell of smoke or, you know, the smoke covering um, the landscape or the sky so that you can't see very well, but we can always smell it. Um, we, here's another picture where you could actually see uh, rays of sun if you look coming diagonally off of the central tree. But again, Young is walking through a burned and smoky environment to try for one thing to get us to think about um, what's happening in our environment. He also um, goes to these controlled and uh, controlled burns and um, uh, wildfire, or I should call it woodland firefighting training sessions and scientific study sessions that firefighters do. The upper uh, left picture is just a study of how firefighters use water from their hoses um, in certain landscapes. They're just studying the effects of water from hoses. And he's also showing us that in a larger landscape with a little bit of an atmospheric smokiness in the background. And then in the lower right, he's showing a training session of firefighters who are working 
um, and learning their skills. Um, you'll notice that they all are wearing orange suits, which tells us that they are inmate firefighters um, from the prison system who have dedicated part of their recovery to being um, highly skilled firefighters. Um, some of us don't know how much of our um, woodland firefighting is being done um, by specially trained um, uh, teams that are from uh, camps around the state. Now, where do these images come from? Um, here is a Sanford Gifford um, American landscape painting from the late 1900s, which shows this atmospheric look. It's not smoke, but Gifford and his um, cohort of, um, of New York painters, sometimes called the Hudson Valley painters of um, very famous landscapes of the United States from the 19th century, were trying to capture the, like the Impressionists in France were doing, um, trying to, to capture in paint the, the atmosphere. You know, what is it like to be cloudy or foggy or rainy or indeed smoky. There were fires, of course, then too. Um, this was taken in, a, this was um, painted in the Catskills, so it's not on the West Coast. But this is something that when um, Young Su was learning um, uh, traditional American art history, um, he was very fascinated by. Here's um, a Joseph Turner painting, someone very famous for creating uh, paintings that almost look like abstractions, the way that he moves his brush, the different colors. But this is called Wind, Speed, no, Steam, Speed, and the, tr and the Train. So this is about a train speeding over um, its tracks. And you can see from the archways, both on the left-hand side of the picture and right under the speeding train that's going at an angle, that it's on a train bridge. But there's steam and there's clouds and it's moving quite quickly. And he's trying to figure out how to capture this idea of the atmosphere and the air. And Young was very interested in this aspect of art history and tried to capture it and found that the way to do so in photography was to go into these smoky environments. In addition to that, of course, he's also wanting us to think about wildfire and environment in California and in our modern period. And then just to remind you of other painters from that period, this is a Thomas Moran painting um, of um, the West Coast. And he was part of the first, um, I have an environmental Kit Kat. I don't know if you can hear her. Are you hungry? Sorry. She's hollering, sorry about that. Um, anyway, Thomas Moran was one of many painters, Thomas or, uh, Gifford was one also, who went um, on the expeditions uh, after the Louisiana Purchase of all the territory beyond the Mississippi River to the West that um, was exploring. What did the landscape look like? And what we find is when we compare these landscape paintings from the early 19th century with actual photographs of the locations, these are quite exaggerated because what we find is that emotion and awe and feelings exaggerate our idea of what we have seen. This happens with us with wildfire, but it also happens with things like canyons, mountains. The Niagara Falls is a perfect example of something that for the first time that you encounter it, it seems bigger than life. And it is large, of course. Um, and painters try to create that grandiosity um, in their paintings. Um, Albert Bierstadt was another painter who went on some of the early expeditions uh, to the West, uh, painting what he saw uh, and totally erroneously painting um, the Yosemite Valley. This doesn't look like the Yosemite Valley at all, but um, it is what um, he presented um, and what he saw and created in his um, in his own artistic mind about what the environment was around him. And you can see that he too, like as Jung noticed, 
um, in his photographic work and tried to replicate is that um, how these artists could labor and use paint to create these atmospheric conditions, this one probably a storm of some kind, is really quite remarkable. Um, what we start to see in the late 19th century as well, we see it here too, one tiny little thing down in the center and the base of the painting is you can see a group of people. What we start to um, pay attention to is what our role in the landscape is. At some times in history, it's a relaxing place. At other times, it's a working place. After the, um, the advent of the railroad and the industrial revolution, we start to see like the train, the steam train going through this landscape, the uh, technology being part of the landscape that we're seeing. Here's a, and then this starts, of course, photography starts at the same time, the middle of the 19th century, early to middle part of the 19th century. And we start to record not only in painting, but also in photography, what those landscapes are seeing and what a worked or industrial landscape looks like. Here, of course, before uh, the tractor, this is the Merced, uh, one of the canals coming off the Merced River in, in Central California, where teams of horses, horses are used to dig and maintain um, the canals. Um, Carlton Watkins, the famous photographer who came out to uh, California to sell uh, mining equipment to make his million, um, discovered photography when he came and began to take photographs that we know. Carlton Watkins' famous panorama of San Francisco, Carlton Watkins' famous painting, or excuse me, paintings, photographs of Yosemite Valley. What we don't realize is that Carlton Watkins was also horrified by the industrial effect on the landscape. And he was one of the first to take pictures of um, hydrauliking, which was, and this is at Malakoff Diggins, which is um, sort of in the, in the area of Grass Valley. Um, you you pass the turnoff when you go up Highway 80 to go to Donner Lake or that way to Lake Tahoe. Um, these landscapes are still there and that, uh, celebrated in state parks so that you can see the type of erosion that was inflicted on the landscape from these high powered um, water systems that were created um, to erode away the landscape during the desire to find gold and valuable minerals that would then wash downstream. Um, at the same time that Carlton Watkins was horrified by this, you also see that he sets up his photograph in a beautiful way. There's these lovely arcs of water that are going. In fact, we learn from research that he had this set up. He had all the hoses going at once so that he could stage the picture. And this is within a ruined landscape, but we also see it as a fantastic photograph. We start to see a turn now where landscape itself turns for artists and photographers into the interest of landscape as a worked industrial place, um, still beautiful on the one hand, but also being destroyed at the same time. And then we start to see um, photographers like Margaret Bork White um, at the, after the turn of the century start to take pictures where the landscape becomes less of an important issue than the technology in it, which is where Carlton Watkins is right on a tightrope there. Um, now the technology starts to take a bigger role than the human and a bigger role than the landscape. This is an excellent example of this because this is a gigantic um, piece of an aqueduct system. Water is going to be going through this giant pipeline as part of a dam project. You can see at the very base of this little pipeline that there's a man kneeling down working on it. He almost lose him if you don't look. And in the background behind this web of wire and steel mesh is the landscape in the background. Um, Margaret Bork White also had been commissioned by um, Life Magazine 
to produce the very first cover of Life magazine, which for those of you who didn't grow up with Life, this was an enormous, huge magazine that does anybody know when it was stopped in the 80s, maybe, or the 90s? I don't remember the last issue of Life magazine, but the first was in 1936, and it was a picture of a giant technological object, a dam. This is the Fort Peck Dam in New York um, against a landscape that you can't see. Why? Because it's blocking the landscape so that the water can impound behind it. You see some clouds. You also again see the tiny little humans in the front showing us that we are proud and excited about the fact that our landscape is now being taken over by technology that blocks and um, manipulates it and that extracts the resources um, that we use to build urban society um, with more and more technology. So we start to become very reliant on technology. My whole point in this series of photographs and pictures is to show you and have you think about the fact all of our artists and fire transforms are thinking about these combinations, the landscape and nature, in conjunction with human life and human ingenuity in conjunction with technology and how those work together and what happens when um, it, that relationship gets out of control or goes too far. Are there any questions so far? Okay, coming to the present, what we see is, um, I think I had shown, I didn't show him, uh, no. Um, Matt Black, who is a current photographer in California who photographs landscapes, worked landscapes, but agricultural landscapes is what he's interested in. He has photographed extensively in the Central Valley. I'm only gonna show you a couple of pictures. What he starts to do is to show us, this is a homeless man who's bathing in one of the water canals of the one of the water systems of California. And he starts to bring to us in, I can say, naked, um, unabashed form, the problems that start to be created when, um, when our technology and our urban focus takes over human life and natural life. So this is a picture that can symbolize um, what technology because of simply the, the, the gigantic nature of the water systems, for example, of California have done um, to people who are living on the land as well. And there are plenty of, um, we can't go into it today, but there are some several uh, documentaries about the people who are affected by um, technology and uh, the issues that we talked about in the first slide of uh, power uh, equity and um, and inequities. This is a picture by Dorothea Lang, famous photographer who was um, doing uh, commissioned photographs for the Farm Security Administration. Um, this was taken in the Santa Clara Valley, um, which had lots of beautiful landscapes. But you can see that again, the person who is um, having to work the land um, in the 1930s during the depression um, is taking the forefront of this um, of this photograph. And then it brings in the idea of how, again, how technology, in this case, industrial farming, um, combined with um, the gigantic water systems that are able to feed those industrial um, farms are um, affecting the people that need to work on them. So these are all these would all be considered environmental examples of environmental art in art history. Um, moving on from photography um, and these pictures, we move right in from Dorothea Lang and the Farm Administration and those photographers to environmental documentary photography, film, and even animation. Um, what we have here is um, a photograph by the artist um, Jeff Frost. 
Um, it's actually a picture of the artist himself um, who did, unlike young Sue, has qualified to be a woodland firefighter so that he can go near fire and know what to do if there's, um, you know, if he needs to, to get out of there, but he can get a, um, a pass to go in very close to fire and take photographs. Um, he does up close photographs of fire like this, and he also takes pictures um, from far away where he can see, he'll stay all night and take um, pictures that turn into time-lapse um, loops um, on video where we can see the progression of a fire, even as we see the stars in the night, in the night sky moving as well. Um, both of these, excuse me, both of these photographs might be considered a documentary photograph, right? We see them on the news. We see these giant flames on the news. Um, but environmental artists aren't liking to sensationalize events as we see in the news, but rather call our thoughtful and mindful attention to those and allow us to look a little bit longer so that we can think about the issues that are involved with um, the art that they're creating. Norma Quintana is a documentary photographer and she works with found objects as well. She um, is exhibiting from her series Forage from Fire, which she created in 2018 when her home and studio and entire uh, life's work were destroyed in the uh, uh, fires in 2017 that were in the Napa Sonoma area. Um, what she did because all of her mechanical um, uh, cameras that she had used formerly were um, destroyed is that she did start using her mobile phone to take pictures, which she had never done before except to take snapshots of her family. She found has found a way, as which is clear from uh, the the enlargement on the right, that she's found a way to to uh, to create photographs with her phone that are of incredible intensity, incredible um, definition and which also bring her message to us um, about what's left of life when your house is burned down. She calls herself a documentary photographer, but these do not look like documentary photographs. Um, they look like intimate photographs of someone's personal belongings. But she really does think of the history of documentary, particularly social documentary photography, like the Dorothea Lang photo, like Matt Black's photo, showing what the impact of um, what we talked about earlier, global warming, um, industrial technology, um, environmental crisis, all of these things that we're thinking of um, when we're talking about environmental art. Um, she wants us clearly to contemplate these things as she's taking her photographs. Um, what she did once she collected all of these items that were uh, left in her of her home when she sift, literally sifted through the ash was she took every object um, and she placed it against the black glove that they were given to be able to sift through the ashes. What she did for our exhibition at, of Fire Transforms is in the back sculpture garden, um, there's a, a series of um, window frames there that she enlarged these into vinyl and then installed them. Um, the final installation looks different from this, but you'll have to go back and take a look at all the objects that um, she placed there. This brings us to found object and multimedia sculpture fabrication. Um, when we think back to what a museum or a collection of objects is, um, we think back to the history of the museum itself. On the lower right, you have a, um, a photograph of the inside of William Wilson Corcoran's home in Washington, DC, which he decided in the late 19th century to turn into a museum. This is how museums began in the United States. Very, very wealthy people who had lots of cool stuff was able to travel a lot. They brought these things back. They displayed them in beautiful ways in their architecturally fine homes, began to open 
their homes for view inside their houses. And these became um, places where we started to see these collection vitrines or these tables with vitrines or glass, um, uh, protective glass over them that we could look in and see the objects. Um, we know there are still museums that you can go to and see objects in this way everywhere. Um, up in the upper right, upper left hand corner, you can see the sign hanging or the flags hanging inside that says Smithsonian Institution, United States National Museum. This is what the original um, Smithsonian uh, Science Museum looked like with all of these rows of tables with glass vitrines over them. This brings us to Norma's work because she's following in a very traditional um, way, both photography, remember, she only used mechanical um, cameras and she had a whole collection of historical cameras that she used to take uh, with. Um, in addition to taking photographs with her, mobile camera after the fire destroyed her home and collections. Then she started to keep those objects, created a traditional table with a vitrine, now not glass, of course, um, but um, uh, enables us to look at some of those objects, um, just like museum pieces. A couple of other artists have played on this exact same idea. Um, I show this piece because it um, it's by um, Felix Torres Gonzalez, who is a tremendous found object artist. Um, and he collected lots of different things and tried to show us by making piles of candy in a corner of a museum, for example, or creating piles and piles and piles of paper in an entire gallery and asking people to take a piece of that paper home or a piece of candy home. In this case, taking two identical clocks, wall clocks that we are very accustomed to seeing and placing them side by side. Um, artists in the early, um, from the Dada movement, which um, Mar Marcel Duchamp started in the early 20th century through the middle of the century when pop art came all the way to the present day, Artists like to collect objects and make work out of them to create different types of statements. Kim Abley's, there's a lot of text on here that you do not have to look at, but because we're being recorded, if um, Karen does post this um, lecture, you'll be able to go back and read the details of the artwork um, so you'll know the dimensions, etc. cetera. Um, Kim Abley's is a very talented and um, community connected multimedia sculpture and installation artist. Um, speaking again about um, prison inmates who dedicate themselves to um, high level training to fight fires, Kim gained several different grants um, with several different organizations, including the Department of Collect Corrections, um, to uh, create with the women um, firefighters there. Um, in Camp 13, it's called a conservation and uh, camp uh, for um, prison inmates um, to create objects called valises. This goes back to Marcel Duchamp, who created projects called valises in the early 20th century, because again, he wanted to look at the, um, the ideas of what normal everyday objects could teach us about art. That something very normal and very everyday that we just would collect in the normal world could also be considered art. Kim is a master at creating this type of, um, of artwork. So she had the, um, the women help her to create these valises, which are like little suitcases or large purses. They all have handles on them, as you can see in these two closed examples. One in the upper left has clear evidence of photography on the outside of a burned forest and some bark from an actual tree on the top of the box. The one in the lower right um, has this bark-like effect on the outside, a leather handle, and you can't see it here, but in the museum, if you go to the art center to see this piece, you'll see that on it, she has carefully written the name and year of every fire that took place in California from the late 19th century, all the way till she stopped the project, which was in the early 
um, 2000s. When, we, when you open the valises, you find surprises inside. Um, here, she's collected um, a, an object from nature, a beautiful pine cone that's usually covered up when the valise is closed. But when it's open, what has she created? She's created essentially a table that's showing a collection under a museum vitrine. She's giving us the idea that the objects in nature that we love and sometimes even think about as museum objects. Look at the giant sequoia trees. We go see them as if they're these remarkable museum objects, but that wildfire is also destroying them. And that's due to partly our actions and um, human history. Another one that opens shows a living landscape on one side and a burned landscape on the other. All of the valises, 10 in total, um, give us um, a lot of food for thought about wildfire's connection to human um, um, action, more than human action, and nature's um, uh, agency as well. Uh, we borrowed four to show in this exhibition, and there are, there are six others. Kim also made something, this is not a picture of our exhibition. I should have changed the slide, but I didn't. Um, you see the trees hanging down. Um, Kim has photographed actual real trees and uh, printed them on silk um, with a, uh, an amazing set of scientific facts that she presents about these trees um, that helps us to think about um, sustainability in the forest. Another multimedia drawing and sculpture um, found object, so to speak, um, artist um, is Erica Osborne. She has a massive, amazing um, body of work in her long career. Um, we were bar able to borrow one small piece of hers. Well, it's small, but it's long. <laughs> so it looks big in length. And it's called 2,749 2, Years for matchsticks, which she made in 2008. She took a bunch of matchsticks um, that are in matchbox holders. These look familiar to you. You close it, right? And it's just a little matchbox. But what she did was she laid 15 feet of these um, in a row. And I show you this enlarged one so that you can see what she was doing. She went out as part of her research and she found the largest remaining sequoia redwood stump that still remains from the logging days of the late 19th century. And she decided to draw every single ring from that tree um, on these matchsticks so that it creates a 15 foot long um, picture of the tree rings for this huge, now dead for over a century um, tree. What she wants us to think about is a couple of things. That again, our industrial uh, zealotry, so to speak, that made us want to develop and develop and develop and have um, absolute uh, mastery over nature has also um, caused us a great deal of problems. Um, sequoia trees, as you may know, when they fall, often shatter. And um, so many of those great sequoia trees that were 2,000, 3,000 years old um, were salvaged just for matchsticks. She made this in 2008, before the great huge mega fires, starting with the Rim Fire in 2013, started in California. So now we can look back and see with some irony, but also a reality check that her inclusion of matches, which indicates a great deal of fire when they're 15 feet long, um, is also intimately connected to the um, to the health of health and welfare of trees and forests. And we're trying to undo the damage now, um, which is quite difficult. Um, I think I'll stop. Let's see, I'll just show you some more of the works. Beth Ames Swartz um, up in the left-hand corner is has made work since the 1970s with um, burned materials, um, uh, I'm going to skip this section right now because I think I'm coming up to the end and I really feel like I want you to be able to ask me some questions or make some comments now um, 
or if you want me to just continue, I can. Karen, why don't you make the call on that? Do folks have any questions for Rena? Should we do a or any comments or anything? Feedback on the show. And if you want to, I can finish, but whatever you wish. Looks like Marsha and Mike un unmuted herself. So maybe she wants to ask a question. Well, Marsha, do you Kent. have a question? Ah. Kent. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Kent. It's Kent, yes. Yeah. Hi, I Kent. Hi. Hi. Uh, you're talking about photography with the small figures on Life magazine. Uh, an image I've always liked is the. Uh, uh, you mentioned her name. I think it's White. Who's mm -hmm. Margaret Bourke White? Yeah. At the top of the Chrysler Building, yeah. <laughs> one of those, one of those uh, gargoyles that, that only only fearless Indian uh, steel workers and maybe a utility guy used to do something. She's up there taking a picture. No, I, I, I appreciate it even more because I didn't, I didn't appreciate it for what you were saying. It, it, uh, it uh, tells us about that history and time environment. and the environment, and it was really featuring the, the, uh, what mankind had created in that <laughs> building in New York City. That, that was uh, that added to my interest in the photo. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. And you know, Kent, that you bring that up. I mean, let's think about it a little further. What's the Chrysler building? It's the, uh, first of all, was, was, is still considered to be one of the most celebrated uh, skyscrapers in the Art Deco style from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, maybe a little later than that. But uh, Chrysler Corporation was building cars, right? So now if we look back at that, you know, celebrating the technology of the new vehicle and what cars can do for us. And now we're like, wait a minute, well, we've used too many fossil fuels and we now need to see if electric, electric cars will work. And, um, you know, it uh, allows us to just open our own view a little or our own lens a little to use a photography analogy to think what is the larger context for um you know for these photographs and works of art too thanks for your comment that's a great one yeah those are all great pictures there were so many pictures I wanted to include but I knew I couldn't put them all in <laughs> who else wants to talk about something I have a question Rena um I yeah. wonder if you can kind of speak to uh, you you have curated numerous exhibitions on fire. Um, mm -hmm. What makes this exhibition different? Um, yeah. Is there anything that makes it different? That's really a good question because it is very different. Um, I had to reconceptualize this exhibition to do exactly what I'm explaining today. You know, back five years ago when I first started doing these it was really as a direct response to the catastrophe and the personal loss and and the horror of of what it was and we didn't understand what was going on because the 2017 fires were the first ones that that destroyed you know huge neighborhoods mile upon mile upon mile of of um, urban um, or suburban development <clears throat> in our memory um, and then that started happening, kept happening over and over again, exactly a year later, paradise burned down. And now we see it moving to, to Portland and, and all along the West Coast. So um, in my own life, because we were so closely affected by fire here um, in 2017, we used those exhibitions as a place for truly the immediate community to gather and heal or still have those feelings of not healing yet um, from what we had experienced. Now, five years later, and seeing it happen all around the globe and um, this phenomenon um, becoming, you know, people call it the new normal, but I don't ever use the, the phrase new normal because I don't ever feel like it feels normal. And I don't want to ever feel like it feels normal. I think we always need to um, feel like it's it's not like it's an abnormal thing that we need to continue to try 
um, to heal from internally, but also to heal society and, and the globe and the planet itself. We, we have a lot of responsibility there now. So what I started to think about was what are the different aspects of things that fire with its own agency, or some might say her own agency is teaching us. And I think that, um, you know, we have a renewed respect for fire, a renewed fear for fire, um, and a renewed responsibility toward fire because um, this is not going to stop. And we have some mechanisms, again, ironically through the technology to try to kind of like, I don't like to go back and say undo. A lot of us who are historians don't consider ourselves going backwards in time, but we consider ourselves learning about history so we can sort of predict and look forward and see what should come next and what can come next. So um, I invited artists who are looking directly at fire and what it's like to live with fire, artists who have lost everything in fires and created out of that. Um, I asked artists who the next ones that I was going to show if there's time, if not, it's okay, um, who are using data mapping visualizations, meaning that they're looking at studying at maps and they're studying scientific data and trying to translate that data about wildfire and climate change into artworks that help us think about those things in new and different ways than looking at a chart, which we don't understand, or being overwhelmed by, you know, these TV and, and news reports that become so repetitive and um, numbing. Um, and then the third thing that I thought of was how is fire on its own a creative thing? And there's so many ways we can talk about that, um, but I invited artists who use fire as a medium to make their work um, to be in the exhibition as well. And I do have more um, slides here, which I can show, but I also know that you wanted to keep it to an hour. And so, um, you know, I can stop here. I could keep going. It, 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 it is really wonderful to look at every work in the exhibition and find ways that it connects to art and environmental history. Um, and that's a really um, neat exercise to sort of teach yourself to do, you know, what more can I see in or around this picture when I look at it, especially if you're drawn to it, like Kent said, you know, with one of those photographs that stays in your mind. Sure, it stays in your mind because it's famous, because it's amazing, but there's contextual and historical reasons why it's really important also. And, and that's what I sort of just wanted to bring up today about um, the history of environmental art in relation to the works in our exhibition. We've got a comment from uh, Robin and Marcia in the, the chat. We would love to hear more. Please tell us about the rest of the slides. So okay. uh, you've got you... permission to keep going. Rita. Okay. And uh, well, that was both of the comments? Yes. Or was there a different comment? Oh, okay, great. Oh, good. Okay, I'll keep going. Yay. It's like when the students say they don't want to go out to recess, they'd rather stay and listen, right? This is fun. So data mapping visualizations, um, there are artists who now call themselves data artists, and this is a, a pretty new thing. Um, I'm going to show you a history of um, a little bit of history about what this means. Here you're looking at two maps that were um, created by the um, Geological Survey the Department of Land Subsidence and Groundwater Study. Um, what it shows you is, here's the map of California, and the enlarged colorful map is the inset of the San Joaquin Valley itself. If you look over at the colorful inset map, what you'll see is that it has gradations of color. You don't wanna pay attention to the yellow, but over here at the land subsidence um, scale, you'll see by color um, that between 1926 and 1970, that's what these years mean, there are a certain number of meters where the land has sunk in the Central Valley, mostly in agricultural areas, because water has been pumped industrial out from underneath the land to such an extent that the land begins to sink. I'm fascinated 
by land subsidence. I grew up partly in the Central Valley. And so I've thought about water in this regard my whole life. And I, in addition to being a wildfire um, scholar and curator, I'm also a water scholar and curator. Um, so you can see that the lightest color, which would be out around the edges near the yellow part, is where the land has subsided or sunk because of groundwater pumping from 0.3 to 1.2 meters. That's about three feet, right, in that range. When we get to the darkest color along this gradation, we find that the, the, the place of most extreme land subsidence or sinking land due to withdrawing land, uh, massive quantities of groundwater is eight and a half meters. Given that a meter is three feet-ish, um, we're looking at over 20 um, feet of um, land subsidence in this dark black area, which is right here outside, right below the word Mendota. Uh, Mendota is known in this world as being the point of most extreme land subsidence. Now, if you are someone who wants to teach the world about land subsidence and you don't have a computer that can make a map like this, like back in 1926 when land subsidence was first discovered, what do you do? This is about representing an idea in an image. Um, this gentleman at the base of this power pole that goes straight up here in the middle of the Central Valley, in fact, right at the point of the lowest point of subsidence in um, Mendota, so exactly where he's standing, happens to be a scientist of, for the USGS called Joseph Poland. And he um, was the very first person who created the Department of Land Subsidence and groundwater study in the USGS in uh, the 1950s, I would say. What he finally figured out how to do when he was trying and trying to teach about this, for example, one of the ways he tried to teach, he didn't have a computer to use, although you can see on the desk here, there's a communication instrument um, from this period, 1941. He made these amazing models that would try to show the relationship of wells and water withdrawal to the surface. He would show diagrams that they would draw and try to show how water would, um, would recede and then make the landfall. But nobody was really paying a lot of attention to that. And still, it's very hard to understand and visualize what the ground looked like in 1925 when the ground level was up there as opposed to 1977, where he's standing right now, which is where the ground is um, ground is at his feet now. It's hard to believe that the land actually subsided from this 1925 marker all the way down to here in 1977. But this was the scientist's way through photography of finally finding a way to show people what land subsidence means in terms of, that were visual, that we could understand. Um, I've thought about and written about this picture so much because it's a very important. Most scientists and water professionals can tell you, oh yeah, the picture of the man standing by the pole, but they don't know that most people don't know that Joseph Poland, the scientist, is the one who came up with this. Now, what does this have to do with our exhibition? Adrian Siegel, who considers herself a data artist, does drawings, cast sculptures um, made from printed data maps. Here's a couple of maps, um, modern ones, very recent ones, that are called fire progression maps. They look a lot like that map that you saw because uh, the first one that I showed you of land subsidence by the USGS because they are um, they're computer generated maps. One is a fire progression map of the um, Paradise Fire and how it progressed. The different colors show on which day the fire um, spread to different areas. And the map on the upper left is the fire progression map that shows different colors for the progression day by day of 
the Rim Fire in 2013. Um, at the bottom, right, we have a satellite picture, which we are very accustomed to seeing now with Google Earth, which also is a modern technological way to show us um, you know, certain data about um, wildfire. But two of the artists in the exhibition um, used these two maps to create artworks. Adrian Siegel used um, the, the uh, fire map for paradise and tried to examine what that would look like in a drawn um, charcoal drawing. Um, it looks like a computer generated drawing. Um, and she may have used technology to help her, but this is her um, interpretation of that map in from an artist's point of view. She made a cast sculpture of the Paradise uh, map to show a vertical way of how extreme those flames were, and she cast this in bronze. So she used fire to create a work that's commenting on science of fire. Um, using the same maps, Linda Gass, through stitched paintings, which um, we would know by the name of a quilt, um, has created a wall size quilt called Severely Burned, the impact of the rim fire on the Tuolumne River watershed. Well, that sounds like it could be the title of a scientific paper about wildfire. She created it in 2014, the year after the rim fire. And in fact, it's the name of her stitched painting, which is a beautiful wall sized um, silk, stitched work, which aims to show what it would look like if you were flying over right after the rim fire, if, which was near Yosemite and came through the um, Yosemite uh, Tuolumne River watershed. You can see the bright blues of the reservoirs and the bright blues of the tributaries of the Tuolumne River. Tuolumne River is flowing here at the base of the work. But her gray stitching shows the, um, the elevation marks of all the areas that were burned so badly that they were reduced to ash, even if they were completely forested. And so what she says is this, if you were flying over at the time, after the fire it had cleared, <laughs> the landscape might look just like this. Um, and it certainly would be black and gray as we all discovered after um, the fires um, struck own land. So sites are so um, data artists are taking scientific and geological data and turning it into artwork so that we can learn more about the scientific behavior of, of wildfire and water issues. I find that fascinating. Um, and then another um, legacy for environmental art is site-specific installation art. Now, when we think of the great big earth art structures that were created in the 1950s and 60s and 70s by the artists who took earth art to a huge, huge level, we think of someone like Robert Smithson who created the spiral jetty in the Great Salt Lake. Um, he created it to show attention to the environmental quality of the lake, the way that it's, um, you know, the it rises and falls. It's an inland lake, so it has no outlet to the sea. And so it's it like the Salton Sea, for example, in California is particularly endangered. And his work changes depending on the level of the water, depending on the climate, depending on the season and depending on what the environment is doing around it. Um, it's a spectacular example of what that idea of earth art um, was during the mid middle of the 20th century. But that legacy hung on um, along with the ideas of landscape that we've talked about and have not, o not only large environmental projects have been installed in the middle of nowhere, like the Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake, or in the deserts, or in the mountains somewhere, but right in Central Park. You may remember that Christo and Jean Claude, um, as one of their most famous works, created the gates in Central Park in 2005. Um, this was a, I was able to attend this not for the whole two weeks. I didn't get to see it in snow, but 
It was a tremendous experience because they were using materials as they always did with all of their um, huge installations in, na in nature or in the landscape to create with technology, but they were site specific, meaning they could only be made, this sculpture can only be made here. This installation is meant to call attention to this environment to the things that are going on here, to the things that we see, and is asking us to see them differently. I love the, the uh, aerial shot on the left because you can see very clearly that there's a delineation, an inner delineation between the natural, quote unquote, natural setting, although of course Central Park is 100% built, um, right up against the urban landscape, which um, is a tremendous um, contrast. Um, you can see the map that shows the extent of the gates. It's really pretty incredible. And then also, um, I just show the one in the wintertime because I didn't get to see that. But um, you can also see that whoever the photographer was who took this photograph was also framing the photograph in a, a tr very traditional romantic um style of photography, you know, with the water and the reflections in the foreground, you can see the bridge, the beautiful old bridge, um, the buildings and the trees in the background a little bit dim, so that you can see this bright orange work also reflected in the center of the picture. This is a very artistic aesthetic um, use of, of photography. But again, we look at how an artist is using technology, um, repetitive technology to create um, a work in the landscape in a gigantic way that creates a lot of mindful thinking and much more extended looking um, to think about um, the ways in which human um, landscapes and natural landscapes uh, coincide, work together, and sometimes work against each other. Um, the three um, installation artists that we invited for um, this exhibition are not making um, work on that grand scale, but it all, it definitely follows within that um, tradition. Morong is literally making um, uh, panels like those that Christophe Jean Claude made. Very large panels. These are almost uh, they're a little smaller, but they they would almost compare in size to the to the panels of the gates. But unlike the gates, which were made out of this. Um, uh, fabric that could really move in the breeze. Um, Morong uses um, metal mesh, very, very, very uh, delicate metal mesh. And then she draws on or paints on them, really draws on them with a blowtorch. Um, she starts, doesn't know where the drawing is going to go. It's very delicate. It seems like the opposite of the terrorizing um, uh, things that we were looking at when we looked at wildfire, but she's using fire and also commenting on the combinations of, of technology, fire, nature, um, as she um, draws these spectacular works. The smaller ones um, are just lovely examples of her painting in a different way, where she layers the mesh and then, um, and then, uh, uh, pulls it around a stretcher to make a little painting, frameable painting, or a, um, one that you can hang on the wall. And what she does is the lower level, the underneath level, is actually painted with um, with different colors of paint. And that is one of the burned um, uh, screens on top of it. And so you get this lovely layering of um, color and the monochromatic burned uh, material from the other screens that she makes with the um, with the blowtorch. Um, Karen, I could not get my computer to open the um, installation view in the museum. So if yeah. you can, if you could open that, it's, it's, a, there's a really good a picture of it in Flickr. And I, for some reason, my, my computer wouldn't open Flickr today. Um, so if you can, sh I'll stop sharing my screen, or I can do it at the very end. Um, and then if you've got it up, you can show it. Yeah. Do you want to do it that way? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Do you see it? I do. Does everybody see it? 
So going into um, uh, to Jonah Ward's glass gallery exhibition is quite an amazing experience. Um, again, it's not on the same scale as the two giant works that I showed you. Um, none of us has enough money or influence to make those. <laughs> but um, what Jonah's working toward in his practice is toward um, expanding his notion of all of these environmental issues dealing with fire and in his case, water as well, um, thinking about the forest, the um, watershed, um, the, you know, we could call it infiltration of human activity, but also just the technology, you know, the ingenious technology that humans are capable of, you know, you start to find out that as one of my supervisors used to say to me, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. And so we have to, ex Jonah helps us to examine the fact that, yes, we as artists and as in, uh, ingenious human beings with great intelligence um, and industry can create amazing, beautiful, balanced things. We can create a technology that can create better lives for us, bigger cities, um, more conveniences. Um, but we also have to be mindful that there's a cost. And when we walk into and through uh, Jonah's ex uh, installation, we're reminded. The columns that are standing up are his version of trees. Um, he makes them by hanging um, heavy brown paper. He has a mechanism that, um, that dribbles water down the paper at the same time that he can start a fire underneath from the bottom and so that this piece of um, paper is burning at the same time that the water is putting out the fire and it creates these lovely vertical um, sort of channelings um, that he then makes into a cylinder to replicate a tree form, um, lights it from inside, and then places a real burned stump at the base of it and on top of the stump, which you really cannot see in this photo, so you have to go see it in the um, art center, he um, works with molten glass also to make some of his work. And so he has these beautiful fountain-like um, structures that he's created with molten glass that's hardened that are on top of those um, stumps to give us lots to think about in terms of life destruction, beauty, and um, reclamation, or rebuilding and recovery in nature and in ourselves. Um, when you walk around, you can see that at the base of the center tree, he's actually brought in forest stuff, which allows us to think about the natural organic material that trees and their roots, as we now are starting to think about, are intertwined. Um, there's plenty of wonderful books and um, documentaries out that you should definitely look for these days that um, show us what uh, mushrooms and fungi do, what um, how roots interact, what water does, how plants and trees can share nutrients and water between themselves underground, um, and how wildfire um, at its extreme um, uh, ruins that um, that unfortunately ruins that unless it's a healthy wildfire and we're starting to learn the difference. So this is a pretty tremendous installation that again comes out of those original um, installation ideas, larger installation ideas that we now can bring inside. Thanks for showing that. Any other questions or remarks so far? I think I just have a few more things to show you if you're able to stay. Are we still good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Great. Thank you. This is terrific. Um, so I need to share my screen again. Where was I? I think. Um, see if this is right. No. You can see all the notes, right? What did you say to do? 
it's the display settings. I think on the top. Where is um, that? Upper left. I have an upper left show. Sure. Oh, this one right here. Oh, uh, display the settings. Okay. Yeah. So you you don't duplicate. Want it. No. Swap presenter view and slideshow. Yeah. Show? Try that. Is that what I want? I think so. Oh, it's already doing swap presenter view. No. Okay. It tried duplicate. See what that does. Nothing. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. We had it before. I know I did. I don't know what happened to. Oh my gosh. I wonder if I closed it. <laughs> oh, I just. No, I didn't close it. I didn't. John Ward. Oh, this is the one. Okay. This is where we were. All right. So. Got it. Perfect. Got it. Okay. So that was Jonah. And, and there's no way to experience that. Like with any installation, there's no way to understand the way in which it affects you and, and interacts with you um, and you with it, except to go inside. It also has wonderful smells. Oh my gosh. All of his, there's burning smells and there's wood smells and it's just fantastic. So you got to do it. He really rose to the occasion. Um, beyond expectation with that beautiful work. <clears throat> Another person who is doing um, what I would call installation um, level works is Adam Shaw, a multimedia painting and sculpture artist. Um, I again, I cannot possibly show you the, the extent of the type of work he does. So I'll focus only on what we showed um, at the um, art center. Um, what's what what Adam did was he he almost lost his home in the 2017 fires, and um, he was in Glen Ellen. And what he did was the shock of that um, made him think literally of sort of the planet and the planetary systems and the universe in a whole new way. He decided to take an entire year off and do only art installation style and sculptural art on a large scale about fire. Um, one of the projects was this called the Planetary Series. And what um, we've done is borrowed um, some of his Planetary Series. I'm showing you a single panel. This is a, um, a, a work that's made up of a whole bunch of two foot by two foot square panels that are metal. And then he uses a variety of different materials, mostly oil, oils and, and applications and fire to create these different drawings of planetary orbs, as he calls them. They may reference the moon, they may reference other planets, they may reference, they may reference stars, they may reference just the entire orb of the universe. Um, he doesn't, um, he doesn't require us to think about it in one particular way, but he has made hundreds of them. And when they are um, complete, um, he has, there's one place where he's shown all of them. They take up essentially an entire huge wall, um, two, four, six, eight, 10 feet here, and two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, it looks like feet this way, and this isn't even all of them. What we were able to show is a four by four grid. It's so six, so we have 16 of them in, um, the exhibition. And um, and he also makes boxes out of these that can create larger um, installation pieces, but they're quite mesmerizing to look at. You know, I think that it's an example of how repetition um, done in a mindful way can be a very meditative experience for us, especially when we um, know the environmental concerns that um, the artist has. So, um, so Adam's work is big work that um, big work and heavy work that, that allows us to contemplate some of these important issues. Oh, this was um, just a mock-up of what Adam had done before he created his, um, his installation. Sorry, I have it out of order, but I like to show the notes sometimes that artists make when they're uh, conceptualizing their, um, their works. Um, and last of all, of course, is the whole idea that artists now are also trying to create and use sustainable materials in the work that they're making because you can go, go buy your you know industrially um, created paints or whatever and and make environmental art but they're all questioning themselves as we all are you know 
we want to recycle. We want to use uh, materials and, and, and create things in a responsible way now and are trying to find as many ways to do that as we can. The two examples that I show here are simply um, uh, ceramic artists who are um, who are foraging native clays from their local areas and also um, building materials uh, for structures that are being rebuilt after wildfire. Tamara Murphy, a ceramic and mixed media sculpture artist, has created a work called Nesting Bowls, a companion to rest with. Uh, she created it in two, 2021 after um, experiencing both the Paradise Fire and the pandemic. Um, I teach at um, periodically at Chico state in the art, art and architecture department and she was one of my students who worked with me in the gallery at um, Chico State and we talked a lot about how her work um, relates to the environment one clearly and fire because one she's creating anybody who creates ceramic um, and fire ceramic is thinking about fire and it's both potentially harmful and also creative properties um, but you'll see here what she did was she she made these two ceramic bowls and then if you see she she um, created holes in them and then what she did was she sewed this padded almost pillow-like material, a quilted pillow-like material that she fitted inside the bowls and then hand sewed it through the holes in the bowls to the bowl. Um, so you have this very odd combination of a bowl that's clearly usable, but what could you use it for in the traditional way if it has a pillow inside of it? So she creates this idea that something that you make for your home that you would normally cook food in or um, serve something with or possibly plant um, a plant in is now something that she literally shows us a symbol of comfort, pillow, quilt, um, warmth, rather than the coolness of, um, of the stone that um, after firing um, clay turns into in the ceramic process. Um, oh, and I wanted to say that <clears throat> Tamara has a huge project ongoing researching and collecting native clays from the Central Valley. Um, she will no longer use manufactured clay. She only will collect the clays that she uses, and she's not the only artist who's doing that. Um, Kayla Stein, too, in her um, beautiful um, multimedia ceramic and photography installation um, called Urns for Manzanita, um, collected ash from a favorite place of hers that was a contemplative place in nature that she used to go to, a little Manzanita grove in the Sonoma area that was destroyed by fire in 2017. And so she created urns using some of the ash and the earth from the from that site um, to uh, enable her to connect her own work, the firing of the clay in a very special way. She also has this super special way of doing this that's very fragile. It can, she says that the works can explode as easily as they can um, complete the firing process. And that that's, she does that on purpose to, to again, walk, walk that tightrope between um, what the earth wants and what we want, um, what we inflict upon the earth and what the earth then inflicts upon us and, and our relationship with nature. It's a beautiful project. Um, and then Gregory Rob Roberts, um, I think to close, um, created this tremendous project um, as a ceramic artist. Um, he collected um, samples of ash um, through a volunteer project in Sonoma called the Sonoma Ash Project, asking residents who had lost their homes um, in the fire, which were thousands and thousands of people, um, to donate ash for the project. What he then did was he created an urn in the shape of the round barn. Uh, the round barn was a real structure from the 18th, uh, middle 19th century from the beginnings of architectural um, uh, development in California. Um, that was a really neat um, monument in um, the Sonoma area that everyone kind of loved and go past the red barn and turn you know left and it was destroyed in the 2017 fires so he made this in the shape of the round barn 
um, created a red glaze um, and a black glaze to go on the outside. But on the inside, as you can see, looking into the urns and the way that we've displayed them close to the ground, you can look into the um, open urns with their tops next to them. Um, every single one of the glazes on the floor of the um, vessel itself, at the base of the vessel is different because he created a special glaze made from the material that was donated from that family or that homeowner um, to um, put in the bottom of the of the vessel um, based on the difference of the chemical makeup of the land the things that had burned every single one turned out differently he creates like all of the artists in this exhibition are very mindful of you know nature human nature culture environment um Nature, natural environment, urban environment. But this also makes us think about what's inside, what makes us up internally, and what we show to the world. All the artists are looking at interiority and exteriority. And he does this in a very, very intimate way by allowing the um, owners of these vessels to either display that very personal glaze on the inside or to enjoy the vessel with its top on and know that their um, their private um, loss has been regained to a certain extent by um, the creation of the artist. Um, he ended up having 120 of these donated. And as you can see on the lower right, um, this was displayed, a special display was made at the um, County Museum of Sonoma. Um, and then the vessels were given back to the owners uh, at the end of the exhibition. It was a year long prog progress. Um, we have nine of the vessels in the exhibition. Um, three of them were donated by um, those who received them, um, who had volunteered in the project. The other six are um, homeowners that, um, that he was unable to find again. So he's hoping to be able to locate them so that he can give them uh, the vessels that belong to them. I think I will stop now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rena. Thank uh, you. I hope that encourages folks um, who haven't seen the show to come see the show and for those yes, who've seen yeah. the show to kind of see it in a new light. Um, looks like Marsha might have a question. Yeah. Not a yes. question. Just, uh, yeah, thank you for putting it into context and just going, you know, we keep going deeper with it and, and I love it. We're yeah. bringing friends who live in the area who helped house people who lost their homes. So th it'll be very special um, for them to see this. Thank you. Great, I'm really glad. And don't miss the, um, since uh, the building of houses, don't miss the um, the conference room or what do you call it, the meeting room? The meeting room, yes. Because there are also, I might have a picture of those. Yeah, right here. There's, um, just we're talking about sustainable materials again, but there are home plans in the meeting room that have been created in conjunction with an architecture firm that um, set up a um, an internship program with the interior architecture students at CSU uh, Chico, where I work, and I teach those students uh, the history of interior architecture. Um, these homes, these little sort of small home plans are um, created to be sustainable um, and were offered free to those who could not or couldn't deal with the going through the architecture process and hiring an architect, et cetera. The plans are ready. They're offered to, to the folks in paradise who'd lost their homes. And several of these are already being rebuilt there. So some of the, um, uh, the materials from that program and a couple of the um, models are in the meeting room. So you'll want to definitely take those friends there. Definitely, because he's an architect, as is Kent. So wow, yeah. perfect. Oh, hey, Kent. <laughs> I'm here in the gloom. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in the gloom. <laughs> this was great. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you so much for hanging around for an extra half hour. My gosh. Indeed. And I just want to remind everyone that Rena is facilitating uh, dialogues with some of the artists in the exhibition. The first one is on November 18th at 5 p.m. It's a Friday. And then the second one is on December 9th, also a Friday at 5 p.m. So please join us for those. 
we'll get our Zoom issues all worked out so it'll be easy. And we're looking forward to um, to hosting Rena again and actually hearing from some of the artists. The from show. the artists, that's the best is to hear right. them talk about their own oh, Thank work. you. Thank you very so much. much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. <laughs>